Welcome back to The Word at Work. This is talk number five. We're in a series looking at the Old Testament book of Kings. Uh, my name is Nathan Lovell. Today we're in 1 Kings 9 and 10. Uh, in today's story, we return from the temple to looking at Solomon and he's getting near the end of his reign now. Uh, we'll see more of his glory, more of his splendor and wisdom and riches. Uh, and no doubt this has all been the result of God's blessing as we've previously explored. Uh, but unlike last time, there's more than a hint here that all that glitters isn't gold. Uh, as usual, you'll get more out of this talk if you've read the passage. So why don't you go and pause the video, have a look at 1 Kings chapter 9 and 10, and then come back once you've had a read. If you wind the clock back about 500 years or so from Solomon, God had just brought his people out of Egypt uh, and he'd brought them to Mount Sinai, Sinai, you'll remember, and he'd given Moses the law that they should follow as his people. Uh, of all the laws that Moses recorded, there's only one that deals with the kind of king Israel should have. You can find it in Deuteronomy chapter 17, but I'm actually going to read it uh, so that we can be on the same page. Here it is. And perhaps as I read it, you'll just have Solomon and what you've just read in 1 Kings 9 and 10 in mind. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and have settled in it and you say, hey, let's set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint a king over you that the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you or anyone who's not an Israelite. All right, so, so far, so good. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you're not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he's to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It's to be with him and he's to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. When we first read about Solomon in the book of Kings, maybe we react ourselves a little bit like the Queen of Sheba. There's so much in Solomon's kingdom that's golden and silver is like dust on the streets, we're told. Golden temple, golden palace, golden throne, golden lions, golden lampstands, cups and plates of gold, gold brought on ships from Ophir and Tarshish, uh, 25 tons of gold a year. Um, and maybe we think, wow, that's a really impressive kingdom. And, and maybe we're with the Queen of Sheba at this point. How happy your servants must be. Uh, we're all a bit like this. We have an idea of what success really should look like. And often it looks like Solomon, doesn't it? But here we are near the end of his story. And we should ask ourselves, well, how successful has Solomon actually been? Not in building a kingdom, but in building the kingdom of God. Your king must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold for himself, says Moses. And we read in chapter 9 and chapter 5, if you'll recall, that Solomon had conscripted labor, essentially slave labor, in order to dig all of that gold out of the ground. I know what you're thinking. It's not okay. And we're not pretending that that's actually okay. It turns out, though, that every big, impressive golden kingdom is built on the back of somebody's labor. Or when we read about Solomon's military power, he has 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, horses imported from Egypt, no less. But you shouldn't go back that way again, says Moses. Horses and chariots in the ancient world is like buying F-22 raptors or something. But... But Solomon is so powerful, he doesn't even need to use them. The Egyptian king actually comes and conquers the Philistine cities on his behalf and gifts them to him as a wedding present. And Solomon has so much land to spare, he actually gives away land. He gives away, though, the promised land to the king of Tyre. 20, ta 20 towns, we're told, Solomon gives to Hiram in Galilee. 
from the land God promised to Abram. There's a logic to the kingdoms of this world. There's a logic to the way we build kingdoms for ourselves and not just kingdoms as political nations. Maybe other kinds of institutions as well, things like families or businesses or even churches. We accumulate wealth and power because like Solomon, it brings us security and peace. That's what we find impressive when we look at people, if they're able to do this kind of thing. Because when the stock market crashes tomorrow, or when the world gets hit by a global pandemic, you know, or, or if there's looting, or if day zero comes back again, or you know, when World War III breaks out, I don't know, we want to make sure, don't we, that ours, that I'm okay, that my family is okay, that my people are taken care of. Accumulation of stuff like this is the consequence of living in a world that doesn't have enough stuff. It's an uncertain world. It's an uncertain future. And so Solomon's military power here is national security. What else is he supposed to do? Solomon's gold is the welfare of the state. Solomon's foreign wife, the Egyptian princess that he marries, is more than just a lover to him. She's a treaty with the nation of Egypt that brings Israel peace and welfare on their southern border so they don't have to worry about fighting there anymore. The logic of the kingdoms we build in this world is that we have to do this sort of thing because it's the only way to ensure that my people will be okay and their prosperity and their future welfare no matter what happens. So the type of people that we think of as successful leaders in our world are people very much like Solomon. The report I heard about your achievements and your wisdom is true, we say to them. Or how happy your people must be, how happy your officials who continually stand before you and listen to your wisdom, we say to them. But according to God's law, according to God's design for leadership and his design for kingdom building, it wasn't supposed to be that way. It wasn't power and wealth that would ensure that Israel lived long in the land that the Lord their God had given them. What was it? Do you remember? It was something else. If the king will carefully obey my word, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over this kingdom in Israel. It's actually fidelity to God's covenant. It's being faithful to God that was Israel's guarantee of national security. If they will be faithful to God, God will be faithful to them. God rescued them from Egypt in the first place. God went into Egypt and brought them out. He was capable of fighting for his people. He brought them through the wilderness. He took them to the promised land. He gave them the promised land. He drove out the other nations from before them. God was capable of fighting for his people. God has been in charge of this history all the way, no matter what. And now, having begun through the power of God, having begun by the Spirit of God, do, do Israel think they must accumulate and fight for themselves in order to stay in the land? Well, it seems like it. Israel's job, Solomon's job, wasn't to build a kingdom of power that nobody could touch. It's not what God's kingdom is supposed to look like. Israel's job was to listen carefully to what God told them to do and then go and do it with all their heart and soul and strength, you'll recall from Deuteronomy 6.4. God appeared to Solomon a second time in this passage. Uh, and every time God appears to Solomon, it gets a little bit worse. And this one comes with a very definite warning for Solomon. If you, verse, um, verse 3, uh, Sorry, if verse 4. As for you, if you will follow me with integrity and godliness, as David your father did, obeying all my commands and decrees and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty over Israel forever. For I made this promise to your father David. One of your descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel. 
But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the commands and decrees I've given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot Israel from this land that I've given them. I will reject this temple that I've made holy to honor my name, and I will make Israel an object of mockery and ridicule amongst the nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled and will gasp in horror and ask, why did the Lord do such a terrible thing to this land and to this temple? There's a lot at stake. I wonder if God is even going to be able to do what he promised to David, to build a kingdom, to have a son of David rule over it in justice and peace and righteousness forevermore. And there's a warning for us in this passage too, isn't there? As we think about the types of kingdoms, the types of families, the types of businesses, the types of churches, the types of nations that we want to build for ourselves, the types of leaders that we want to follow. There are many impressive kingdoms in this world built by very impressively wise people. But what sort of wisdom does it take to build God's kingdom? And where can we find leaders who will listen carefully to God's word and do it, even in those moments when it doesn't look like the wise thing to do? I'll see you again next time as we see what happens to the kingdom Solomon built in the end. We'll be looking at 1 Kings chapter 11. I hope you'll join us then. Bye for now.